Thank you so much. Okay, I'll turn my video. Kyle, I'm unable to turn my video on. I'm wondering if you could grant me that power, please. You should be able to now, Heather. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to the final Lytton Center um, for History and the Public Good talk of not only the semester, but the academic year. Um, my name is Dr. Kyle Libby. I'm a professor of history and co-director for the Center, Lytton Center for History and the Public Good here at Ohlone College. Myself, on, on behalf of myself and Dr. Heather McCarty and Dr. Catherine Michael, my fellow co-directors, very excited to welcome you to this talk by Christian Sweeney from the AFL-CIO. Before we begin, I'm gonna share a little bit of a housekeeping with you and also share with you the mission of the Lytton Center. Um, and I wanna start with the mission of the Lytton Center. The Lytton Center considers ways that the study of the past can help shape the present and future. Our mission is to inspire the Ohlone community to work for the public good through programming focused on access, equity, inclusion, justice, and service. The Lytton Center explores challenges facing our community in the world, past, present, and future, and fosters big ideas that will inspire and transform Ohlone and the larger community for the better. Through training, programming, and capacity building, the Lytton Center empowers students to advocate for a just and equitable world. Today, during the talk, we're very excited to hear your ideas and thoughts and questions. So please do use the Q&A feature um, at the bottom of your screen as the talk is progressing. We'll have plenty of time for a question and answer um, at the end of the talk. I'm going to pass things over now to my fellow co-director, Dr. Heather McCarty, who's going to introduce today's speaker. Thank you so much. Um, it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Christian Sweeney. He currently serves as the Deputy Organizing Director of the AFL-CIO. Christian <clears throat> began his union activity as a young man, as a doorman and elevator operator in New York City. He went on to hone his organizing skills while as a graduate student at the University of California, Berkeley. Sweeney played a key role in helping graduate student instructors win union recognition at UC Berkeley and then as well at the other UC campuses. He went on to become the first president of that newly formed graduate student union, the United Auto Workers 2865, which represented at the time and still represents today um, about 12,000 academic student employees in the University of California system. Sweeney left graduate school to pursue work as an organizer for the UAW, where he worked for more than a decade, helping to lead successful organizing campaigns for more than 60,000 workers. Uh, he left the United Auto Workers to join the AFL-CIO, where he currently is the Deputy Organizing Director. And he's worked on a myriad of campaigns from higher education to gaming, to manufacturing, to childcare, and so much more. And he has dedicated his life to assisting workers from diverse industries and backgrounds in forming unions. And it is our pleasure to have him here today to speak to you all about the history of the labor movement in 45 minutes or less. Excellent. <clears throat> thanks so much, Heather. I really greatly appreciate it. And uh, thanks, Kyle, for the introduction. Um, the, um, I'm super excited to be here. Um, I got my start in the labor movement, uh, in a, aside from being a member, um, you know, just up the road from, from, uh, from Maloney. And, and so, uh, the Bay Area is near and dear to my heart, and it's it's labor movement. So thank you very much for being here. Although I joined you today from Washington, from Washington D.C., where the AFL-CIO is headquartered. Um, the AFL-CIO, just so folks know, is um, the the labor federation that most of the unions in the United States belong to. Um, we represent about uh, we have about twelve thousand or so uh, members of uh, AFL-CIO unions that uh, coordinate together as a as a federation. Um, so our members, technically speaking, are the are the unions, you know, and from the American Federation of Teachers to the auto workers to the steel workers, the postal workers, uh, the transit workers are all part of this uh, AFL-CIO family. So, uh, and I uh, here at the federation, I help. Um, we have a department that helps support those unions and their organizing campaigns. Um, so, what we'd like to do, what I'd like to do today, <clears throat> excuse me, 
is um, spend about 45 minutes or so um, just doing a quick kind of uh, thumbnail sketch of the history of, of workers in the United States and particularly history of the labor movement. Um, and the goal, this I've done a similar kind of talk for for various audiences, but uh, this also this originally started off as a way to kind of give AFL-CIO employees and an orient or an orientation to sort of how to have a, a working knowledge of, of labor history. And I think that um, you know understanding the institutional labor movement, uh, the past of the institutional labor movement, can help us to understand sort of why we're, why and how workers organize themselves today is the kind of big part of it. Um, so I've got some slides that we'll run through. Um, and I'm going to offer uh, a couple of ideas. Uh, feel free to dump questions in the chat. And um, with that, we'll, ta we'll take it away. So thanks so much for your for showing up and for, for your time and attention. All right, and I'm going to share my screen. Oh, one, there we go. All right. and. Um, so I, I would argue that uh, if you had labor his, any labor history in your high school U.S. history classes, uh, it was probably taught with, uh, and even probably some college classes, um, that the history of, of the labor movement was probably taught as a noble failure. That basically the, the typical um, narrative that's used is that uh, things are really bad for workers way back in the olden times, uh, there was, they struck, those strikes failed, somehow they managed to, to, uh, to eke out some power and you know, do things that create an eight hour workday. You know, maybe you get a touch of uh, a, you know, AFL-CIO and the dynamics between the two organizations before they merge. But really the primary dominant uh, sort of theme of US labor history as it's usually taught is of, of, is of noble failure. And that's totally wrong. It's totally wrong. And it has the convenient uh, impact that it, it prescribes uh, labor history to kind of the, the dustbin of, of the past. It allows, it allows uh, people who own stuff, uh, the capital class to, to say, oh yeah, that was an important thing back then, but don't worry about now, Everything, everything's better. You know, don't worry about uh, trying to organize yourselves. Um, I'd argue that instead that the right narrative, the right theme for the history of the labor movement is that of innovation and adaptation. That as the economy in the United States has changed over time, as the people who make up the United States has changed over time, that they, that they have uh, adapted, innovated, and changed the various forms of organization that they've employed to you know, have some power, to take control to some extent of their, of their uh, working conditions and their work lives and the very share of of, of the wealth that their labor produces um, to get some, some better portion of that than, than what the owners uh, and capitalists would otherwise give them. Again, innovation and change, not noble failure. In, innovation and adaptation, excuse me. Um, so let me, uh, I wanna, before we get into this sort of major theme, take a minute to, to address the question of sort of, why should you care? Why does this matter at all? Um, yes, it's exciting, we're seeing you know, if you if you follow the news, you've probably seen stories about Starbucks workers organizing and Amazon workers organizing, and, a, and a, in the last year or so, you've seen probably some some high profile strikes in various parts of the country. But but really, you know, why should you care uh, what happens to the in, in the labor movement? Uh, that lead, leads to our first uh, slide here. Uh, let's see if we can change the slides. Hmm. Let's see. There we go. Okay, super. Um, so this is a a, uh, a really important uh, chart. Um, it comes from a, from the Center for American Progress from a researcher named David Madlin, but you can find it lots of places. Um, and you know, it sort of in some ways is this this chart is kind of used to support the idea that labor movement's a thing of the past. In the on the red line here, uh, you see union membership rate. This is the proportion of workers in the workforce who are union members. Uh, and that line, and this is a chart that goes from 1967 to, to, um, to, uh, to 2009, it's pretty much the same. We have a little dip down, a little bump up, and a little dip down again for the last couple of years on, this, on, on these numbers. But generally, you see, we go from a period uh, in the late 60s of you know, 20 some odd percent of workers 
uh, in the economy, we're members of unions, down to a situation now where we're now just a, just a hair above 10%. Um, and you know, that uh, is representative of a number of things. One of the things it's representative of is a increase in productivity in, in industries that have high rates of union membership. It's also in, in indicative of um, changes in the economy and a failure of, of the labor movement to, to grow in new parts of the economy. Um, so why does that matter? Why does it matter if people are union members or not? You'll see in the blue line there is the middle class share of aggregate income. This means if you knock off the top 20%, knock off the, the bottom 20%, the, 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 the rich, the richest 20% and the poorest 20%, you know, where is that, that bulk of the middle part of the population, uh, middle class is broadly defined. Um, where does that, you know, who's getting that, that uh, what portion of, of income is going to them? It's that blue line. And it's, you know, it's a pretty tremendous uh, correlation here, right? As union membership decreases, the, the broadly defined middle class, you know, also gets a decreasing share of the, of, of the income of, of the whole economy. Uh, you know, this basically, you know, tells the story of income inequality in the United States. As union membership has, has gone down, it's, you know, the, the proportion of, of wealth that's gone to the uh, income and you know, it goes to the middle, the middle class uh, decreases. And we'll go to our next slide here. Um, here's another way to look at this in terms of, again, why should you care about, about uh, what happens in the history of the labor movement? Um, you know, for a long time in, in, a, in American history, productivity and wages were pretty correlated, um, uh, again, until the you know, early 70s here. Um, so you see the light blue line is, is hourly compensation. The dark blue line is productivity. And you know, round about the mid '70s, those there's a huge break between uh, the proportion, you know, in, in productivity and wages going together. And there's a monster amount of more productivity, but hourly compensation stays pretty flat. Uh, we've seen a tiny bit of uptick in that, but last last couple of years, but not much, uh, not much of a change, and certainly nowhere near the change in productivity. So where is all that money going? What's happening with uh, all the extra wealth that's produced in, in the U.S. economy? Well, here's go, we're going back to that old uh, slide that we just saw a minute ago. Now we're adding in uh, the green line there is the proportion of wealth going to the top 1%. And so, you know, this is, if you wanna think about sort of what's the history of, of inequality in America, it's basically a history of the, the middle-class share of income dramatically decreasing and that money being siphoned off and going to the super wealthy. Uh, you know, this really sort of nails the, the, the question of, you know, why do we have you know, one of the factors of why one of the most important ones of why we have such tremendous inequality, uh, such rising inequality in the United States right now? It's in part because of collapsing bargaining power uh, for for a big portion of the workforce to to get a share a fair share of the wealth that they produce, um, and that's that's the story of uh, of you know the kind of the real class warfare warfare, warfare that happens the sometimes. Um, people on the right like to say, oh, there's class warfare, warfare. These, you know, they're, they're going after the rich people, they're going after Elon Musk. Well, it's actually class warfare happening in the opposite way. It's from the rich on down. So, uh, so how do we, um, and that's what we're, we're gonna talk about is what are the means that working people have to, to stop this? And how have they over the course of US history tried to get their fair share is the you know, fundamental question. So, and I would argue that working people, that's not noble failure, it's innovation and adaptation. As the economy has changed, working people have changed the forms of organization that they've used to try and to try to get their fair share. Um, so where do we start this story? Um, the institutional labor movement, you know, mostly dates from the, 18, uh, from the 1870s and, and on, um, but that's not the start of work in America at all, right? Um, the US, uh, the, the colonies that that uh, that end up becoming the United States are founded large, you know, got a little bit of religion, but largely as economic enterprises uh, to try and extract uh, wealth from the New World. Um, that's mostly a, a failing game until until cotton, um, you know, comes around. Cotton, tobacco first, and then cotton. Um, and the work in that period is not done by uh, by free people. Sometimes. People don't think about enslaved people as workers, but enslaved people did the work, right? Um, they, their, uh, their condition of slavery was a was the owner's solution to, to how to get free labor out of human beings. 
Um, and so I would argue that we should think even, you know, although we're gonna talk mostly about the institutional labor movement today, we should think about uh, all of US history as being a, you know, a history of contests over work. Who's gonna do the work? Are they gonna get paid? What systems are gonna be used to force people to do the work? Uh, how are those systems gonna be fought over and contested? So here's a, a uh, sometimes we don't think about uh, you know, slave rebellions as strikes and slave rebellions were not, you know, there's a difference of course, um, but, but it's important I think to ground ourselves in, in the, in the uh, even in some of the most brutal aspects of, of American history. Um, the, you know, in colonial America, slaves did a huge portion of the work. Uh, it'd be very hard to make tobacco and cotton profitable crops um, it, without, uh, without slavery. And, and the, the, we developed a system of slavery to, to, to extract the greatest, the greatest amount of wealth. But enslaved people uh, wanted some say in how that was going. And, and that was a brutal, brutal system. So here's a, an illustration from Nat Turner's Rebellion. Um, Nat Turner's Rebellion was one of the largest, although many unsuccessful slave revolts in the United States. Uh, no, no successful slave result, uh, long-term successful slave revolts in the United States. Uh, tip of the hat to Haiti there for the only, carrying out the only one in, 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 in the new world. Um, but you know, it's we're we're good to re, it's good to remind ourselves that even under the harshest conditions, under the style of slavery that exists in the United States, uh, some of the most brutal kinds of slavery they ever practiced anywhere in the world, um, that uh, that were the people who did the work, uh, regardless of their material conditions, you know, tried to to stand up for themselves to to impact how 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 they were being treated. And you'll see it says the horrid results. This is obviously printed in a news, you know, printed from a newspaper from the, owned by the owner class, right? Uh, Nat Turner and his rebellion killed about 60 people, ultimately uh, was put down. And, he was, and uh, he, Nat Turner and his fellow uh, uh, revolters were, were, were killed. That's the next slide. So going up to the sort of period of the, you know, to look at this history of the institutional labor movement, I'm sharing here a, uh, a chart of changes in union membership from 1881 to 2000. And so what you notice there are a couple of things um, is that, you know, this, and this is really the story of the, like how we end up with the modern, modern labor movement. Um, the, the growth in the labor movement has come in spurts. Um, you get a spurt around here in the early 1880s, again in the, in the, you know, in the 1890s, 1900, again in the, in the teens into, into the 20s. Uh, monster spurts in the in the New Deal and during the Second World War and the period right after, uh, and again the 50s and 60s. Um, and these spurts are examples of of adaptation and change of of workers innovating and figuring out new ways to to organize themselves and to to have an impact on their on their work lives. So each of these major phases um, and and old you know. And, and, uh, an old historian's trick is to think about periods, right? To put a bunch of facts into periods and try and make sense of them that way. Um, each of these major fa phases of spurts are re you know, represent uh, ways that workers organize themselves and changes in how the economy worked and how workers adapted themselves to that. So if you think about that first phase in the 1880s, uh, this is the, the era of mass worker organizations of the IWW, working men's associations. We're going to go in more in depth on each, each of these three and how, how the economy changed and how the, work, how the workers changed. Um, the Knights of Labor, the IWW. The, the next major phase change that happens uh, is craft unionism. Uh, we'll talk more about what craft unionism means. The, the, AFL, the AFL half of AFL-CIO is the, the American Federation of Labor. Um, the, in the in the 30s, we see a rise of industrial unionism, corresponding to the rise of sort of the super powerful corporations. Um, and this is the, the CIO half. Uh, we'll talk more about which unions those are and what that means and how they organize themselves. And then finally, uh, the last period of spurts are, is public sector unionism. Think about uh, education, healthcare to some extent, uh, public services, uh, you know, counties, government, state workers, et cetera, federal workers. Okay. Let's talk more about these different uh, periods and, and what, what's happening. So in the 1860s and onward, uh, you know, think about American history uh, and what's happening in the United States in, in 1860. This is a, an image from uh, one of the first Labor Day parades in New York City uh, in the 1860s. The, um, excuse me. Um, 
the, the labor movement was very loosely organized. This, this is the period of mass immigration. Um, there's, you know, the population of New York between um, 1845 and 1855 doubles. Like, you know, the city doubles in size in a, in a 10 year period. Most of that driven by Irish and German immigration. Um, the, you know, just a monster change. Imagine if the city where you live doubled in size in a period of 10 years. Um, these working men's associations are founded to deal with very basic things. The first things that they're, that they're doing is um, just dealing with mutual aid sorts of things. How are we taking care of the people's, you know, when people die, are they getting a casket and getting a burial? What are we doing for the widows and orphans? That said, they're, even though they're dealing with basic sort of how can we pool, our, pool ourselves to, to, um, to take care of the things together that we, you know, to, to provide mutual aid for each other, um, they're also in contact with, um, with working men's associations around the world. And they have loose links to the sort of early um, formations of, of various communist uh, efforts. Um, the, they're dealing, this is the, 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 the labor movement of the eight hour workday. There's a radical element uh, in it for sure. Um, you see various organizations that, that, that come to the fore. Um, they're generally, um, uh, some of them are practicing a kind of anarcho-syndicalist model without collective bargaining, uh, as, as we know today, without contracts, without a union contract to negotiate at the end. They're advocating for broad-based uh, changes. This is, the labor, this is the labor movement of the Knights of, the Knights of Labor who start to move towards collective bargaining um, of the IWW. Um, some of these movements are, are uh, inclusive, but a lot of these working associations are not inclusive at all. They, a lot of them exclude uh, African-Americans of women, there's on the West Coast in particular, some of these working men's associations are linked to anti-Asian violence. Uh, in, uh, there's a, a number of uh, uh, these groups that are involved in trying to keep uh, uh, Asian people out, out of California and other parts of the West Coast. Um, overall, um, they're kind of fragile uh, organizationally. They tend, they don't last because they don't have a very strong bonds of membership. People are paying a little bit in dues, but they're not, they're not really tight organizationally. Um, and they're, they're seeking change through broad reforms. They're not, um, it's not so much about this group of workers engaging in collective bargaining with, with this group, this individual employer or groups of employers. Um, but that's the kind of, if you think about a city that's got you know, doubled in size, that uh, is industrializing, but corporations haven't really consolidated to, to become single powerful entities. This kind of broad based activism, protests in the street, marches in the street, seeking reform are, is the kind of uh, way you can get some power, uh, where you can achieve some, some, uh, some gains along, along the way. So cities start to implement various reforms to ban child labor, to, to create standards for, for, for working hours, et cetera. Um, all right, so the, but the IWW is also comes up, uh, you know, uh, in this period, they're one of these uh, mutual aid kinds of approaches to unionism. Uh, they, um, uh, this is the, you, IWW still, still exists today. Uh, their, their image uh, here is of the savvy cat that they believe uh, in organizing all workers into one big union, um, engaging in sabotage if they had to, uh, in order to, uh, to, uh, to win demands from, from employers. Uh, the IWW um, isn't just active in cities, they're active in the lumber industry and, and mining in various places. But weak bonds of membership that make it hard to really sustain the organizations. And also I would say a lot of the, uh, some of what we see in labor activism today is not that dissimilar from these broad-based uh, organizations of loose affiliation um, that we see happen today. And some of the conditions we have uh, are not that dissimilar. If you think about like the Domestic Workers Alliance or some of the activism that's not exactly membership based, uh, that, but that's seeking broad societal reforms. Okay, the craft unionism. Uh, in the 1880s, uh, we see a rise of craft unionism. The AFL, uh, the American Federation of Labor is founded in 1886. Um, they generally speaking uh, reject um, the, the left, the you know, serious left leanings uh, that exist in the sort of earlier forms of the labor movement. Uh, they engage in something, Samuel Gompers, who's a cigar maker uh, by, by training and trade, who's the uh, first president of the, of, the, of the American Federation of Labor, uh, practices what he calls pure and simple unionism. The idea here that sort of underlines is like, we're not gonna be trying to you know, make a whole new world. We're trying to get a couple more bucks an hour. 
for working people who have certain skills. So let's get all of the you know, electricians who work in St. Louis together, and we're going to set you know, you know we'll get we'll sit down with the employers if they want, but we're going to set a rate for how much it costs to have an electrician do work in our in our given area. Um, this is uh, this approach, um, you know, while not seeking the broad societal reforms that that some of the earlier labor movement did, um, it emphasizes you know it it, it is effective uh, by controlling labor, especially skilled labor in certain, in certain crafts and certain geographic areas, um, they're able to grow an in institutional power uh, and they're able to win benefits for, for their members. And you know, the, there's these organizations uh, pretty quickly by, uh, by the end of World War I, you've got, excuse me, 3.2 million members in AFL unions. Um, the, uh, they emphasize local control, they emphasize democratic control um, so that the unions elected their own lead, their leadership, they elected bargaining committees, they um, they uh, they had a, a, a strong bonds of 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 uh, membership uh, that led to durable, lasting organizations. Um, but there's problems here too. Um, the you know these organizations they generally uh, excluded uh, women and African Americans. Uh, they their emphasis on skilled labor, you know, uh, was reductive at times, and you know, not well suited for the next phase of how the American economy would would change. But if you think about American um, America in the 1880s, you know, this is a rise of industrialization. Um, again, more you know, more immigration. So skilled laborers, people who had skills, could could uh, could bargain for more for more power. It's a it's an adaptation to the economy as a whole to say we're going to get instead of getting everyone together, we're going to get just these little groups together who have uh, a, a skill set that they share in common that they can control uh, in order to, to, uh, to bargain for, for higher wages and for the start of, of, of benefits as we understand them today. So the next uh, change in terms of the economy and change in terms of uh, how workers organize themselves, here's a, um, here's a flyer from the mine workers. So if we had working men's associations as the first period, second period is the craft unionism. You know, uh, if you think about America um, in the, by the 1920s, what's happened in the economy? By the 1920s, individual corporations have gotten immensely powerful. Um, you know, this is, you know, when by the time Ford Motor Company comes along, um, you know, by the time the steel companies come along, they are, you know, more than just, you know, factories. These are individual corporations that control whole, whole industries, vertical integration. How on earth are workers going to get some power to get a fairer shake in, in what, they, what they get in their return from work? Um, so they come up with this concept of industrial unionism, and the mine workers kind of are the first to do this. Um, and they actually break away from the AFL in part on the, around this strategy. So uh, industrial unionism is the concept that Everyone who works in a given industry should be organized together. So, in the in the early days of trying to organize the steel industry, for example, they had separate unions for the the furnace operators, and another union for the people who puddled the steel, another union for the people who uh, did the Bessemer process, another union, you know, all these separate crafts of individual, you know, skill sets that went into how to make steel. That's a nightmare, right? It's an impossibility to get those people together, and of course, they were divided on long ethnicity, and they were divided, uh, you know, by race as well. Um, and there's no way to build power. And so, uh, John Lewis, the mine workers, come along and they say, "No, that's how that's not how we do it. And down the mine, we're all equal. We all do the same work. Uh, you know, we're all we all got to be together." And so, they come up with this this concept of industrial unionism. And from you know, the basic principle is that all the workers have got to be together, and that's how we're going to build power because these companies are so big. And so powerful worldwide companies for the first time in some instances um, uh, that we need to get ourselves together to, to rest power. Again, innovation to an adaptation to how the economy has structured itself. So you'll see this this um, this uh, flyer. You know, says a strike to end fear. Um, how do these workers get power? They oftentimes struck right. And if you've got all of the workers who work in the facility all together in one union, then you can have a strike. Right, that that shuts the production down. That that's that uh, gets power that way. Um, the uh, the and and those 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 um, uh, changes were remarkably effective. Um, unlike the 
the um, the AFL unions, most of these unions were inclusive on the basis of race, somewhat on gender, not perfect by any means, uh, not perfect on race by any means either, either but, but way better than some of the AFL unions were in the past. They practice a certain kind of militancy. Uh, there is a fair amount of left politics in them. Um, and they're, they're practicing this kind of wall-to-wall -wall organizing uh, in order to, to, to build power uh, in a bigger way. Um, here's a photo from the uh, 19, uh, 30, Five uh, sit-down strike uh, in, of, of General Motors workers in Flint, Michigan. Um, this, in this instance, uh, and this is you know, before workers across the whole economy have the right to form unions under federal law. So, what what could workers do? In, in Flint, Michigan, they sat down. They took over their factory. It was an occupation, um, and a relatively small group of workers uh, figured out how they could use a strategic choke point in, in General Motors at the time, biggest corporation in the world, uh, use a, their, their vulnerabilities against them. So they figured out how to shut down key factories in Flint, Michigan. Um, here you see in the, in, in the photo, an end to the strike. The strike ended on February 11th, uh, but you know, and, and workers uh, got, you know, made a calendar on the, on, on the door of the, of the car. Um, in, the, in the Flint sit-down strike, um, the, you know, and other sit, other sit down strikes have been attempted before Flint, um, not to as positive impact as as Flint was. Um, they uh, the workers put up a valiant fight in the middle of winter in Flint, Michigan. If you've ever been to Michigan in the wintertime, it is mighty cold. So the co the company shut off the heat to the plant, shut off water to the plant, smashed all the windows. Um, there was you know active uh, violence you know, between strikers and, and the company. Um, interestingly, compared to some of the other sit down strikes and, other, and, and you know, many other strikes in general, um, the, the General Motors tried to get the, the governor of Michigan to, to um, bring out the National Guard, the army, uh, to, to evict the workers from the, from, the, from, the, from the factory. And the governor at the time, um, Governor Murphy, refused to do that. And he actually, um, the, the National Guard came into Flint, but they, but they actually kept the strikers and the, and the, and the company uh, thugs apart from each other, which gave the strikers more power, right? Because it meant that, that, the, that the General Motors productivity wasn't starting again. They weren't able to start the factories up. Um, it's it, it, innovation here in that you've got the union using state power to try and level the playing field, another you know, you know, innovation. Um, Sit-down strikes are remarkably effective. Eventually they're made illegal, um, like lots of things uh, that are effective. Um, the, uh, these unions have, you know, part of this industrial unionism is a centralized approach to power, um, centralized approach to power in order to match the integration of the corporation. Again, you know, innovation and adaptation to what they have. They tended to have national negotiations. So you try to get the whole company organized all across the, the, the whole, the, the country and get everyone together to negotiate the contract, not just an individual city, but now what good is it if we have, you know, negotiations over here? If over there you'd be able to do something different, um, a part of the you know innovations of industrial unionism. Um, these unions, as I mentioned, you know, were were more progressive on the question of race. Here's a photo of the African American Organizing Committee at Ford Motor Company. Um, you know, long before uh, affirmative action and national civil rights legislation, uh, the labor movement understood that uh, when your goal was equality, you had to make a special effort to include. Um, you know, all segments of the workforce, uh, you know, no noted contrast to the way that uh, employers have tried to divide workers on the, along those bases. But not everything's perfect. You know, at the same time as this was going on in the late 30s, just a few uh, years later, there's 1943, there's an awful race riot in Detroit, Michigan, uh, where, you know, workers, um, uh, you see fights, uh, you know, and, and violence, killings, burnings of buildings uh, between white and black workers in, in, uh, in Detroit. Um, so it's not trying to say it's everything's perfect by any means, uh, they're, but they're trying at least to address these issues. Um, here's another photo. These unions, these the industrial unions practice a kind of what we call social movement unionism. Um, they, they get people together, they have bowling leagues, their, their union hall becomes a community hall for, for various events. Um, and, and the, they have tremendous successes. These are the, you know, this is sort of the period of time you think about the 50s, really. Uh, this is a photo from the 50s from, I'm not sure if it's a UAW meeting or a steel workers meeting, um, but the, the 
this, these are the first unions that negotiate health care. These are the first unions that negotiate pensions, negotiate a cost of living increase, uh, health and safety, just dramatic, dramatic changes. You know, when we think about what do, what do people who work in America get for their jobs, like whether they're things you expect, you expect to get health care, expect to get you know, uh, some sort of retirement benefit. The, this, stuff, this stuff is kind of worked out by these industrial unions. unions. Also to note here, take a look at this picture for a minute. Um, and you know, what's interesting here about this picture, I find a couple things. One, uh, these are you know, industrial workers, uh, factory workers, but how are they dressed? Right? They're wearing suits. They look like pretty well pulled together, right? Um, they're, they're holding up dollar bills. Um, my guess is that this is a photo of a fundraising activity, probably a fundraising activity for politics. Um, these unions got involved in politics and, and you know, played an active role there. Uh, also notable um, is that uh, there are you know, black workers and white workers sitting together. Um, part of what we see in the reaction to this period of unionism, especially in the South, is that uh, racist elements in American society devise a system called right to work laws uh, because they don't want this happening. They don't want workers getting together across race lines. Um, that is, the, especially in the South, they're like, no way, we are not having that. We're not having black workers and white workers get together. Um, and so this is uh, part of the difference between, if you think about the politics of a state like you know, Michigan or Pennsylvania compared to a state like Alabama or North Carolina, uh, is because th this kind of thing happened in, 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 in places like Michigan and Pennsylvania and didn't happen uh, so much in Alabama or, or North Carolina. Um, although it happened in Alabama more, more than we recognize. So uh, Alabama is a special and interesting story. Um, all right, so let's keep on moving here. Um, it's not limited to industry. Uh, Sit-down strikes and industrial unions spread in retail. Here's a photo of Woolworth workers um, uh, engaging in a sit-down strike um, the, uh, you know, as, as a means to establish their, their union. Um, the uh, Woolworth was kind of a target of its day. Um, uh, still occasionally you can find a Woolworth somewhere um, for the older folks in the crowd. And as I tell you about the Woolworth lunch counters, that's a, another story in, in the civil rights history. All right, um, this, you know, this, these industrial unions are also the unions of Rose of the Riveter. And here, you know, the CIO uh, unions were active in, in, in manufacturing, AFL unions were active in manufacturing as well. AFL eventually adopts some of the CIO's industrial union strategies. Um, I want to include this photo in part because it's one of the, the photo and the image, the photos from right up the road from where you are. It's from, it's from Richmond, California. Um, from a, you know, a, a worker in an airplane factory in Richmond. Um, and I also want to just take a minute to say that, you know, in, in the Second World War war effort, um, you know, many of these workers were members of unions. Um, you know, the Rosa Derivator was a union member, um, but, the, but it wasn't as simple as that. Um, while there were white workers in the plants, there were black workers as well. Um, not surprisingly, racism in American society and in manufacturing and sometimes, and oftentimes, sadly, in the unions itself meant that black workers generally got worse jobs than white workers. Um, and the, uh, but they were, but, but, but black workers fought for, for better rights on the job and had, had uh, contract, contractual protections to, to do that. Um, so uh, the Rosies, um, these women who entered manufacturing and helped win, win the Second World War you know, came in from lots of different elements of American society. So um, let's think for a minute about the the post um, the post war period. Um, just get into that time. Okay. Um, if you think about post war, uh, how does the American economy change uh, after World War II? Um, well, one thing that happens after World War II is that although there's free public education generally in America, lots of parts of the country don't get you know, don't get real, you know, public education all the way through high school, you know, uh, in widespread availability until after the Second World War, um, you know, especially in more rural parts of America, um, there is the growth of public services. Um, and this photograph is a photograph from the 1968 sanitation strike uh, in Memphis, uh, Tennessee. This is a strike that uh, Dr. King was, uh, was going to meet with these striking workers uh, when he was assassinated in 1968 in Memphis. Um, the story here, uh, the trash pickup work in, in Memphis was mostly done by, Af almost exclusively done by African-American uh, men. Um, two workers in a short period of time were killed in, in, um, 
doing this work in, in accidents that happen in the, in the trash pickup uh, process, and they struck to, to establish their union. Um, it's important to note that public sector unionism you know, didn't come first. Uh, people thought, well, the companies, they have the money, you could organize there. Public sector was not seen, like nowadays we think about, well, if you have a public sector job, like it's got a pension, it's got a good health care. That wasn't always the case. Workers had to go on strike to establish unions in the public sector. Mostly that happened in the 50s and 60s, uh, in, in 70s, and even into in today. There's still a lot of public sector unionism. So uh, so what happens, public sector grows, employment in public sector grows dramatically in, in the, in the post-war period. Workers adapt yet again. They say, well, we don't have rights under the law, the way the law is structured, because we're public employees, we're employed by the, by the state. Well, you strike, they, they get active. Eventually they pass laws, which establish the right for public sector workers to organize. So this period is, uh, you know, you think about the rise of teachers unions, of um, postal workers unions. Postal workers went on strike in 1970 in order to establish the right of uh, postal workers to organize. Um, many of these, these uh, in the same way that the mine workers gave money to help support uh, workers in steel and in auto and, and rubber and other industries, many of those old CIO unions uh, supported uh, and gave money to public sector unions to help establish themselves. We see this as a tradition within the labor movement of you know, the, the labor movement that exists at one point says, oh, this is a new thing happening over here. We got to support them. We got to help them stand up for themselves. Um, we also see a dramatic rise of unions in, in healthcare and higher education in the same period, both public and, and, and private sector. But I think about broadly public services. So, um, and so, so much so that even though private sector union membership is going down for you know, that same period we talked about before, public sector union membership is actually going up. Um, and now we have a share of labor movement that's more public sector than private. So these spurts that we see, again, just to remind you, are you know, um, due to innovation and change. As the economy changes, workers change how they organize themselves to get their fair share. One of the things I would note from this chart of spurts is we get a spurt in the 1880s, again, 1890s, uh, teens and 20s, 30s and 40s, 50s and 60s. And what about the tail end of this chart? We're kind of due, right? Uh, for a long period of time, every so often we get these spurts of, 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 uh, of organizing and we're due for another spurt. Um, and I'm optimistic that we're probably on the front, you know, early stages of seeing that spurt happening now. And you know, if you think about the economy now, what does the economy now look like? Um, it's expanding into technology. It's a, we have an immigrant workforce. We've got a lot of service jobs that, have, that are crummy jobs. Um, we've got uh, independent contractors being used uh, as a way to skirt um, uh, other kinds of labor protections. Um, we've got you know, tech, even on the high end of, of technology workers, we see people not totally satisfied with the way corporations have consolidated power. So I've included a little graphic from the video game workers that are organizing now. Uh, this is a photo of three women uh, from the Google walkouts that happened recently. Uh, a photo from um, the Amazon workers in Staten Island, New York, who just organized uh, uh, earlier in April. Um, taxi drivers in New York and elsewhere who are organizing and organizing uh, taxi and Uber. Flock, uh, the Farm Labor Organizing Committee is active in the South. Uh, organizing farm workers, uh, organizing across borders, both in Mexico and in the U.S., to address um, the you know how immigration uh, works and H two A visas, uh, and the Fight for Fifteen, right? You know these uh, this you know started about ten years ago um, to to try and figure out how to organize fast food um, with it, with all of its challenges. Um, but worth noting is that the old labor movement doesn't entirely go away as time changes. These and these you know organiza workers and they you know, figure out how to organize themselves differently to to get their fair share they also um, the old organizations either stick around or they change too so here's a photo from recent strikes in west virginia and in, in new england of teachers and supermarket workers these are long established unions uh, but they're changing the way they fight and they're changing the way uh, they 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 exist and, and adapting as well um, so you know the there's a lot uh, there's a lot to understand about how and why workers organize unions and, and engage in collective bargaining. It has an impact that goes you know, across the whole economy. It affects the very kind of basic democracy we have um, and whether or not uh, things are shared broadly or narrowly in our society. So uh, with that, I'll stop and hopefully we'll have some time for some good discussion. And I think we mostly kept to under, well, just about 45 minutes. So all of US labor history in 45 minutes. 
I have to say that is pretty impressive as someone who teaches labor history as well. I am amazed that you managed to roll that all in uh, truly in 45 minutes or less. Uh, it is it is super impressive. Um, we have a lot of great questions that have come in. And um, you actually, I'm going to start with a question that you actually sort of just set yourself up for a little bit. So more of asking to expand. Um, and it is that the story that you've told today makes clear how important union membership is for maintaining a middle class. You also highlighted changes in the 1970s that shifted that correlation of productivity and wages to the benefit of the corporate class. The need for union membership seems obvious given what you've presented, and yet it hasn't happened. Um, why do you think the labor movement has been slow to adapt and innovate over the last 50 years as your last graphic really highlighted? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think, um, I think to some extent there has been a fair amount of adaptation and change. Um, it's not been perfect by any means. I think, it's, I think it's hard. I think part of it's democracy. Um, you know, as what I've seen in working in the institutional labor movement um, and you know, working for one large national union, and working at the Federation, is that, you know, unions are democratic organizations, which is like both their blessing and their curse sometimes. And you're, you're inevitably, the people that, you know, the system of collective bargaining we have now, uh, which is kind of a meld of both like craft and industrial unionism, is really based on a model where, you know, workers are members, they pay dues, they, their contract negotiations happen, that sets the terms and conditions of employment. And they elect their leadership, they elect their bargaining committees, they elect their local union leadership, elect their national union leadership. It's easy, or that system is designed to take care of the current members, right? There's a there's an institutional bias for like, first thing, I got to get elected, right? First thing, I got to make sure that like the last contract was a good one, and that, that I got my folks on our side. So like, the immediate problems are much more pressing than like the proximate problems. And so that's one aspect that like is a, is a, it takes visionary leadership for people to say like, okay, we have this thing, but we're really we're heading over here. And that's really hard to do uh, just in any institution, um, any democratic institution. I think that there's also, you can't underestimate the impact of how crummy our labor laws are. I didn't really talk very much about our labor laws in the course of this, uh, but if you look at that sort of period, like where union membership goes up and then it starts to like collapse, um, part of that is really an effective use of our system of labor laws to uh, divorce workers from power and to make it hard to establish new unions. Um, if you look at the survey research right now, you know, people like union support for unions right now is at like almost 70% in public opinion polls, extremely high. Um, if you survey people even more pointedly about like today, would you want a union where you work, not just like generally, yeah, unions are cool, like your place, like would you want one? And even unorganized workers, like all people have a union, like yeah, 100%, we don't want to get rid of a union. But the even unorganized workers, more than half say, oh yeah, today, if there was a union election in my workplace, I would vote for it. Um, now, that, <laughs> despite that being the reality, like it's pitifully small, the number of people who organize every year. And part of that is like, there are so many barriers that our labor law puts in place. So for example, in uh, Amazon, right? Um, we can use either the best the Alabama story or the Staten Island story. Um, uh, so workers, let's talk about Alabama, right? So in Alabama, um, a state that for the South has a relatively high union membership, um, workers uh, who were, you know, start working for Amazon, places open for a year, and it's brutal. Like it's, they have these production productivities, you can't go to the bathroom, you got a cameras on you all the time, like people pushing you, pushing you, pushing you. It's physically a brutal job. Um, and the workers say, uh, the union there, RWDSU, has a presence in the South, they've organized poultry plants, they've organized lots of other kinds of things. And they contact the union, say, hey, we wanna organize, things are pretty bad over here. They get 30%, more than 30%, which is what you need to trigger a union election. Um, Amazon's caught by surprise. They file for a petition for a big, big Amazon facility in, in Bessemer. And so what does Amazon do? Amazon goes like bananas, right? They start putting up signs in the bathroom. They start every day, workers have to go to what's called a captive audience meeting where they, they take workers, they sit them down. And basically it's kind of like brainwashing where they like tell you about how bad it is. Like everything you like now, none of that's gonna be the way it is going forward. Um, if you wanna see an example of this, there's a movie that's on Netflix that's really great called American Factory. Um, it's about a glass factory in, in Dayton, Ohio. 
um, that shows they actually someone brought a camera into one of these captive audience meetings. They're very, very powerful um, in terms of their ability to to um, to intimidate people and threaten people. Uh, and some, some of those are against the law and some of those are within the bounds of the law. Um, but there's this whole industry of union busting that's very hard to, uh, to, to, to fight against. Part of the reason why you see increasing union membership in the public sector, but collapsing the private sector is most public employers don't really do that. Most public employers are kind of like, eh, we don't really wanna have a union. They might go after a couple people, but they don't really fight that hard. Um, in the private sector, it's not like that at all. In the private sector, they make you feel like the sky is falling uh, if people try to organize and, you know, they'll fire people. I mean, just down the road from, not even down the road, you know, in the same town in, at Tesla, we got Tesla's fired people for trying to organize the union there. They've, you know, um, uh, disciplined people for trying to organize the union, totally in violation of the National Labor Relations Act. Now here's the kicker. So what do you get for violating, the National Labor Relations Act is the law that governs most collective bargaining and, and, and establishes the right of private sector workers to form unions. If you're uh, Elon Musk and you fire someone for organizing and they go out and get a job that pays one penny more an hour for, you know, uh, compared to the job they had at Tesla, you know what Elon Musk's financial liability is for that? Zero. If, if they go out and get another job pays more, no, no financial liability. If they, go, if, they, if they don't get it, if they don't actively look for a job, no financial liability. They have to actively look for a job. If they, if, if they look for a job and can't find a job, all he's liable for, or let's say they get a worse paid job, all he's liable for is the difference in wages between the job they got and the job they had before. Um, it's, it's a lot of employers see breaking the National Labor Relations Act as just cost of doing business. So like the, the legal regimes that are set up against workers are pretty miserable. That said, do we have a lot to blame to take? Heck yeah, we could be doing a much better job. Um, this actually is a, a, a great segue to another question that one of our, our students asked, which is what can be done at the fate, uh, federal and state level to support unions? Because part of what you're talking about is what we do have in place already is not really being enforced or the enforcement mechanisms don't have enough teeth yeah. to actually make them meaningful. So, yeah. so what can be done at the federal and state levels to support unions? Great. So there's a piece of federal legislation called the PRO Act, the Protecting the Right to Organize Act. It would basically extend a bunch of the things we have in other kinds of laws to federal labor law. So it would be penalties. If you break the law, there's actually some financial penalties. That would be a start. Um, we have that for environmental law. We have that for civil rights law. It would be it would make labor law similar in that way. Um, there's a bunch of other reforms that happen in the Pro Act too that would that would make organizing way way easier. Currently, that's not going to happen. Um, the Pro Act is not going to pass uh, because of the filibuster and because of the balance of power in Congress. The um, the um, but like what's happening right now in the Biden administration is the administration of the National Labor Relations Act is a zillion times better than it was during the Trump administration. So there are political appointees that get cycled out in a, in a different different administration. So one of the things that happened in the Amazon campaign in Staten Island this is like one of the biggest things is that Amazon you know was going after people. They fired people for organizing um, the national. They were able to demonstrate it and. Rather than just having to post a notice saying, gosh, we'll never do that again, the National Labor Relations Act, the National Labor Relations Board General Counsel said, no, what you're going to do, what our settlement is, is that you're going to give workers in your, in your facility, we get access to the break rooms to have union meetings. And like that was a, a, a huge difference. So, like the workers who were at Amazon who helped to lead that campaign in Staten Island, they basically hang out, hung out in the break rooms and ran union meetings all day long. So people would go to the captive audience meeting and then they would come to the break room and say, what, I heard this crazy story about, it's gonna be like, you know, this? And they would say, no, 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 like that's bogus, here's why. Um, so that was a huge part of the difference. So the administration of the law matters. Um, there is more that we could do. So for example, um, we don't punish people who violate, you know, in addition to not punishing labor law violators um, in like this, you could probably, it might take a little legislative change or some work. You could probably say, if you're a violator of federal labor law, we're not gonna give you public contracts. You know, you don't get, you don't get um, to use public money if you're out there, you know, we've all agreed, unions are good for us, we're good for society, they're part of democratic culture. We're gonna, we like them. <laughs> um, uh, we like when work people get together to, you know, level the, level the playing field. Um, you could probably say, look, if you've got a certain number of unfair labor practice charges, you're going to be uh, barred from public contracts. Uh, that would be a big, that'll be a big, big change. Um, so, and that's kind of, I mean, various times in U.S. history, if you look at the 30s and 40s, the, you know, the, the, during the uh, Great Depression, during the New Deal, and during the, during the first, the Second World War, 
the um, uh, the federal government played a much bigger role, saying like, enough, like we're not going to have it this way. Um, and so we could we could see that again, but that requires a different politics in Washington. Yeah. Um, and the Biden administration has done, given like the cards they've got, they've done a really good job. Uh, but there's more that we could that we could do. Great, thanks. Um, I will, I'll ask the next question. It's a little bit of a departure, but actually kind of picks up on some of what you've been talking about, especially this idea that we're due for this reinvigoration of, of organized labor. Um, but before I have to actually have to say, we've gotten a few questions and, and um, comments in the Q&A, and I want to acknowledge all of our um, all of the folks um, from different branches of organized labor who've come out for the talk today. Um, as someone who's active in our own faculty union here, it's really great to see folks come far, far and wide. Um, so I, I want to go back to your framework of the labor movement as a story of innovation and adaptation instead of this idea of like a noble failure. Um, thinking about this idea of this, you know, this next wave that we should be seeing, what adaptation and innovation do you think needs to happen in order to revitalize the labor movement? Yeah, that's great. That's a really good, that's a really great question. Um, so I think one of the things is you got to figure out some way to do it outside the board. Like the labor board process is, is you know, it's kind of, it's a dead end. Um, you got to figure out how to either like neutralize that board process or do it outside the board. Um, if you look at what's happening at Starbucks, I think that's interesting. So they're now they're like Starbucks, they started this handful of stores in Buffalo, New York, organized union, like God bless these folks. Um, and they, you know, they had the CEO and all these big wigs flying into Buffalo, New York uh, to, to, you know, face down a bunch of 20 somethings, you know, who <laughs> work at Starbucks. Um, they, uh, and they didn't buckle. And now they've set off like this wildfire of change. Um, so uh, so they, they're using the board process to their advantage. Um, uh, and they're filing petitions before the National Labor Relations Board to like establish their unions. You can't, I mean, like, I, I hope that they keep on winning that way, but it would seem like eventually you've got to get to the point where you're doing that at a bigger scale to work, work beyond the board. I feel like the other thing, the thing that Starbucks though has done, uh, and I feel like it's the, the Starbucks workers have done, and I feel like this is a thing that happens in successful organizing campaigns that we need to figure out how to do more, is that working people have taken ownership of the organizing campaign. Um, the professional organizers uh, like me are, we can't rely so much on staff. Like it can't be a staff driven thing. Uh, working people have to take control of the organizing themselves. And so um, when we organize the, you know, the people who do 60% of the teaching in the University of California system in the in the late 90s um, that happened because one there was a strike you know, we didn't have coverage under the national labor no, under the state collective bargaining law for higher education so we went on strike um, to uh, it was very very much a real grassroots organizing effort just a handful of staff and then all of it was just worker volunteerism um, that made that happen and eventually a coverage under the law and then and then um, and then one or most recently you know uh, student researchers in the UC system, again, like they they filed under the under the law. University of California, very very powerful employer. We're like, yeah, we're not so sure we're going to do that. <laughs> we're going to appeal. We're going to delay. We're going to do this. So they took a strike vote, right? And they had like some crazy high participation in in, in the strike vote. And they, um, you know, eventually the university they were between that political pressure, an imminent strike, um, the the university said, okay, all right, fine, we'll, 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 we'll agree. And so I think it's like a combination of like worker militancy, worker ownership of campaigns, some different strategies. Um, you gotta figure out the immigration stuff too, right? Um, since the Hoffman Plastics decision in the 90s, uh, undocumented workers in America, um, basically the labor laws don't apply to them. Like there's the employers can violate the law with no penalty. Now there's very little penalty as there is, but there's really, really uh, rampant abuses that happen of undocumented workers. And so there've been a number of organizational strategies that people have used to try and organize in, in, in um, populations of workers with their, have lots of undocumented workers. Um, and some worker centers, I think are maybe part of the answer, um, but especially in California and Texas, like in construction and all kinds of fields, um, immigration status and the way that employers use that to, to bully workers is, is a monster problem to solve. Thank you, that's excellent. Thank you so much. Sure. Heather. 
Um, yeah, so I will shift us in a slightly different direction. There's been a couple of questions that are sort of uh, focusing on a little bit of that theme of like, how do you handle sort of shifting worker pools, right? And so this one is not necessarily about undocumented immigrants who are not afforded this kind of protections, but is actually one about contract labor. Um, mm -hmm. And so yeah. it, this question is, you mentioned that new industries, I'm assuming tech, have not lent themselves to a strong tradition of unionizing. As we become ever more tech reliant, how do you see organizing slash unionizing taking shape in a contract heavy industries? Could it actually happen given the way many people are hired as contractors instead of as employees? Which is a, a really question. smart question. Um, so um, yes, I think it can. Um, if you look at um, you know the a lot of the trends that exist in tech um, have existed before. Right there for all the innovation, um, you know, just because it's happening on a computer doesn't mean or on the web, uh, it doesn't. It, it's a lot of these things. You know, what's old is new. You know, is new again. Um, so the, um, uh, you know, if you think about the gig economy that's often talked about, construction is the gig economy. The entertainment industry is the gig economy, but you know, workers organize themselves in ways to get power. Uh, to to adapt those systems, right? To say no, we're not. We're, you, know, you can't do this as casually as you want to. Um, so we have other examples of like construction, entertainment, other industries where where uh, even even in a, in a place where people are hired episodically um, by changing employers, um, there are systems you can use to to do that. So some amount of it, I think, has got to be uh, stricter enforcement of, of existing laws. Um, that's an important piece of it. And that's if you look at the, it's the other kinds of industries that are established that, you know, hire people in similar kind of gig arrangements. Yeah, you know, there's, there's that. Um, uh, like big piece of it though, is you ha there's no substitute for like organizing the workforce for getting all the people who share the skills into, uh, or, you know, some organizational, um, uh, in thing, you know, like, um, if you look at the Communication Workers of America um, is doing really interesting work at Google. Um, and so they've established, you know, rather than try to run National Labor Relations Board elections at Google and you know, get to a majority and then file a petition, they're taking a sort of a more slow build approach. Um, so they have this thing called the Alph Alphabet Workers Union. That's a voluntary union um, that people, you know, that's sort of a kind of slow and steady build kind of a model here. Um, and that's, I think, a, a, a It'd be really interesting to see how that how that goes. They're really excellent organizers. Um, Google workers who are great organizers who are who are involved in that effort. Um, so you know, I think their their approach is ultimately the power comes from having the people organize. So how do we over time? You know, you don't have to do it all at once. You don't have to do it overnight. Um, how do we how do we build voluntary membership with a dues based system? So there's resources. There's a telephone line. There's you know you know a website and and you know there are meetings and you know all the things that the culture of an institution that they're that they're developing um but they're not trying to do it all in you know in a month right so and and you live or die on that to sort of a more slow and steady build um i think that's a super smart approach and probably a big part of the answer um and there's been lots of other kinds of coalitional work in tech um the tech workers coalition in the bay area uh that's that's got smart people working on these kinds of issues as well um, so I would encourage people to check out that, check out the Alphabet Workers Union um, to, to, to look at those. Um, if other people have answers about that, it's, um, I haven't lived in the Bay Area in 20 plus years, but um, with, you know, I'm curious about it. Uh, but I don't think there's anything like constitutionally about workers and technology that make them not want to organize. I think that some people would like to think that, um, but that's not true. Um, you know, if you look at the success of organizing in higher education in the last 20 years, um, you know, which is which um, has tons and tons of engineers and postdocs and you know people with highly you know specific uh, kinds of science education. Um, when those folks are working for the University of California, when those folks are are you know working for other uh, other institutions, when they're working in the federal government, they're mostly organized. Um, why you know why should it be the case that they're not organized if they're working for for these tech companies? Okay, great, thanks. My turn. Okay, so I wanted to ask you sort of acknowledged in your talk, um, something that I think we talk a lot about with our students when we talk about organized labor in America writ large, which is it's a has a complicated history um, when it comes to dealing with race and gender. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, and by complicated, I mean, oftentimes complicit with white supremacy, <laughs> like, you know, it's, you know, it's obviously a, you know, a vast right. 
landscape. Yeah. And there there are lots of examples here in our, in our deep history of organized labor in the United States. Um, I guess I'm curious about like going forward, what role do you see organized labor playing in racial justice movements and movements to dismantle white supremacy? Like where do you feel like there's an in and an opportunity to mm -hmm. maybe undo some of that history? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's also, I appreciate the question. And, and I think that's, that it's important uh, to include that stuff. When I do this presentation, you know, I'm not at all trying to say like, you know, what's the best graveyard on these questions? Like they're 100% reality part of our, part of our history. At the same time, there's also um, a, a wonderful history of supporting civil rights and of, you know, championing these places and the labor movement's been a home to, you know, uh, people like Barry Rustin. And I mean, you know, there's, there's a, Long history of activism of of all you know of all kinds uh, that are that's based in in the labor movement um, and so uh, for for the ignoble parts there are also tremendously noble parts too um, the the um, I think it's a super important question I think that it is um, something that is talked about I can say just from like personal experience you know being at the federation and being in executive council meetings, which are the meetings of all the presidents of the various unions, like it, these questions are talked about constantly. Like they are, they are um, and they, they were before um, the, the, the reckoning that's happened after George Floyd's murder, but, uh, and they're especially on now. Um, at the Federation, we uh, uh, actually, because of, in part, um, in response to the Ferguson uprising, uh, we, we did, we, did a uh, race commission um, to do listening sessions around the country with union members about their experience of, of racism, racism, you know, in their work lives, in their unions, um, you know, to sort of try and think about, you know, what what role do we have, you know, to be inward looking and out and outward looking as we deal with these things, um, and so. Um, uh, and, and we've kind of revitalized that effort in the last in the last year as well. Uh, and there are resources online if people are particularly interested. There's a race commission report, and then a task force that's under underway now to implement uh, some of those recommendations. Um, you know, certainly, I feel like at a basic, really important human level, the more people that have coverage under a collective bargaining agreement with strong non-discrimination protections is intensely important. Like that's that's a very very real way to to address uh, racism. There are smarter things. There are things even smarter than that that you can do around bargaining. Um, you know, uh, I worked with clerical workers at Columbia University. Uh, Columbia had a had a merit merit pay system that was not even that big. It was like a little extra that the bosses could give out for merit pay. But the clerical workers did a you know race and gender study of how merit pay was implemented. Surprise, surprise! <laughs> White guys were getting the highest merit pay. The black women were getting the lowest merit pay. You know, and, and they in bargaining they went to the university and said like show us you can be trusted. Like, until you can be trusted, this is nonsense. We're not gonna do this, right? And so it was a hard fight, a hard fight, but they, but they, but they won that. Um, and so I feel like the, the, collective, like the basics of collective bargaining um, are really important tools to make sure that people have protections and that they're addressing these issues you know, with their employer about you know, the pay and benefit ways that, that race and racism pop up in, in, in people's lives. Um, I think there's a special role that the labor movement has to play around mass incarceration. Um, and that's been a, a topic often discussed in the Federation with the role that um, uh, there's a lot of, there, many corrections officers unions are part of the Federation. Many are not. Um, most police are not part of the Federation. Um, handful are, maybe 5% or so. Um, uh, but I feel like the the um, institutional labor movement has a, has a in part because like those are really those are hard jobs where you definitely want a union um but there can be distortions in the system that get created over those issues so our current president led a process with the police unions that are part of the federation um around around how policing works and sort of trying to um you know the whole thin blue line thing is real like you know and and, and how the the intersection between like Hey, the labor movement's about you know protecting work, you know workers and the job, but that can get twisted in a in a really awful way. I mean, we've seen it you know over and over again, right? Um, so we've got a response to that. Um, it's not uh, it, 
that that was written you know by the police unions that are part of the federation that talks about how do we how do you create systems that allow police to not be bound to protect bad actors right that's a big portion of the problem um but i mean but the so there's the, the, that's a reform effort that's underway that's uh, on that policing front, but um, and we've done some a bunch of things around mass incarceration as well in terms of just making sure that um, despite representing corrections officers that like that we're advocating for um, uh, criminal statutes that that seek to end mass incarceration. Great, ah. thank you. So, so yes. There's, there's a lot of work to be done there. That's what I have to say about that. Yes, there's a, a yeah. lot of work to be done there. That's for sure. Um, the one I, I want to ask this question because I know you'll have great stories to share, and it's from one of our students, and I and I um, I think it'll probably have a hopeful spin, but no pressure if it doesn't. Good best. <laughs> what have some of your personal experiences with unions been like, and are people still expressing hope about the effectiveness of union power? Um, boy, that's a really good question. Um, so <clears throat> there's, uh, I don't think there's anything like the change that happens in people's lives when they go from not having power, <clears throat> excuse me, when they go from not having power to having power. Um, you know, when people go from, from not having a say in healthcare or maybe not even having healthcare in their job that's affordable or meaningful in any way to getting it. Um, when people go from you know years and years and years without wage without wage increases to getting you know a wage increase and what that means for them, it is you know transformational on a on a mass scale and sometimes very much on an individual scale. Um, I think you know for me uh, personally, um, I was in a uh, after college I taught high school for a couple of years. Um, really love history and, and thought I'm gonna try and get a PhD and see how that goes and see if maybe university teaching is the right you know path for me. Um, and uh, when I got to Berkeley in the in the 1996 seven 97, um, the uh, there was an organizing campaign that was already underway. Uh, our members made about twelve thousand bucks a year if they had full time work. Um, the international students who were who worked uh, their spouses uh, if they had them could not work. Uh, many of them had kids. They were they qualified for for lots of assistance. Um, the married student housing was like falling apart. War wartime housing that that um, you know um, that existed from the Rose to Ripper days that the university hadn't done a darn thing about. Um, you know they were just crazy kinds of abuses. Um, the stories that I heard uh, from people we were organizing with about sexual harassment, um, you know, were just did make your hair curl. It was, it was um, you know, the survey research on like teaching assistants and research assistants and the, the percentage you experience uh, sexual harassment at work is are just astronomical. Um, and, you know, when we got our first contract, we won a 40% increase in compensation. We got tuition remission for the first time. We got, you know, real non-discrimination language for the first time. It was, it was a huge change. It was just a, it was like a light bulb going off for me. And I felt like, <clears throat> I felt like the work of history was in great hands. Uh, the the people that I was in uh, the graduate program with were you know top notch and stellar, and that that we that I was much more drawn to this organizing work than I was to the, to the academic work, um, and that that the process of organizing of having you know when we first started organizing, we, the law was against this. There had been a bunch of failed strikes. There was like no chance in hell we were going to win a darn thing. And we were going up against the biggest employer in the state after the state itself, um, and so the you know that realizing that you could like systematically talk to people one-on-one -on -one and get them to you know agree to sign a petition or agree to take some little small action or you'd find someone who would say you know hey let me introduce you to my coworker and like build activism that was totally like a light bulb going off for me like wow this is how social change actually happens it's not just because we're smart about it, or it's not just because you know there's more people of goodwill. It's actually you carry it out from nothing to something, um, and being part of that process was was totally totally revolutionary, um, you know. Um, and you know, I've, I've 
I'm not sure if I'm doing a great job at, at, at articulating it, but that process of organizing, which is in part about like winning the union in the end and like sometimes winning an election and sometimes, you know, uh, putting pressure on an employer enough to, to change things. That's amazing. But just like the personal transformation that you see among people who go from not having power to, to figuring out how to build power is really an exciting thing to be part of. Um, and, you know, especially when it's, uh, when you're working with people who historically don't get a lot of power in America, it's super exciting to you. I've worked with you know, child care providers who hadn't had a raise in 15 years, who all of a sudden got, you know, doubled their salary in, in many instances under our first, first contract. That was, you know, these are people who are dealing with really some intense poverty. And um, the, that, uh, um, that was very powerful. Um, so yeah, the, the, I've worked with, in Atlantic City, New Jersey, I organized casino dealers who hadn't been organized before, and we stopped um, smoking on the casino floors um, because uh, you know people who have been breathing in secondhand smoke for twenty years uh, got to not have to do that anymore. Like that's and the, and the the employer didn't want it, but we forced it. And so you know the, those kinds of changes in people's work lives are are kind of revolutionary. Um. As a little aside, I have to say, uh, Christian, I was an undergraduate at Berkeley in the <laughs> late nineties, um, nice. and was a I was a writing tutor, and I actually remember. Oh yeah, writing, right yeah. So I I participeated in one of the strikes, which was nice. really awesome. I saw my T-shirt um, <laughs> somewhere. Great. Um, so I, I think I vaguely remember you. So this is one nice. thing I just had to say, like, as I That's keep great. looking at you, I'm like, oh, pretty sure I've seen, was in a meeting with you uh, once or twice. Um, so we have a very specific question, which is actually kind of awesome. And I'd love to hear the answer to this. Um, the question is, I've been very interested in the story of Jock Yablonski mm -hmm. um, in cleaning up the United Mine Workers of America. Thoughts mm -hmm. about why he isn't a bigger part of American history or even labor history or mm -hmm. any thoughts you have about his story overall? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, Yablonski is a really important leader in the in the mine workers. Um, it's a, he's yeah probably someone who should be more of a household name uh, for sure. Uh, there's I remember seeing a really good documentary. There's a really good Yablonski documentary about cleaning up the the mine workers. Um, and it goes. I mean, Yablonski is just for background for folks who don't know. Yablonski was a reformer within the mine workers who fought, fought against um, you know corruption, uh, basically sort of. Um, mobbed up aspects of the union. You know, one of the you know, lots of times there's a connection between organized labor and organized crime. And you know, mostly that's not that big a thing, but it, it's certainly less of a thing than it was uh, 34 years ago. Mostly the way that happens is democratic organizations can be, excuse me, can be corrupted. And, you know, can, especially if they control pension funds and health and welfare funds, there can be a big pile of money that's very attractive to criminal elements. So if they can, you know, dominate a, uh, an internal union election and they get access to, to big piles of funds. Um, so Yablonski was a reformer within a really heroic leader within the mine workers. Um, he was uh, assassinated um, in, you know, as part of, uh, you know, by criminal elements. Um, I don't have that much more to add, but I would say that the, the leader of the AFL-CIO, um, who the current leader, our current president, is a wonderful woman named Liz Schuler. Um, but prior to that, it was uh, Rich, Richard Trumka. And Rich um, come, came out of the mine workers and was elected as a reformer, uh, a young reformer in the mine workers, very much in that Yablonski tradition. Um, and when he was a really young guy, like 30 something, um, he became the president of the mine workers um, and then led successful strikes in the 80s. Uh, really, you know, established the reestablished the mine workers as a fighting union, and you know, established him, himself as a as a as a real voice of worker militancy within the whole labor movement. And then in 1995, uh, President Trumpka, or then Secretary Treasurer Trumpka, became Secretary Treasurer of a reform slate within the AFL-CIO. That 1995 reform slate within the Federation, there was a guy named John Sweeney who also just passed away, sadly, no relation. Um, but John Sweeney, the Sweeney Trumpka and Linda Chavez ticket was this reform slate in the, in, in, in the, in the mid nineties that was really revolutionary. It's something that it's a bit of labor history that's still kind of waiting to be written. Um, but uh, they, they really changed things up. Um, you know, the labor movement historic for a long period of time, really from the from thirties the had taken this kind of protectionist position on a lot of issues, including immigration. Um, very foolishly, I would argue, um, but the Sweeney Trumpka uh, team totally changed that around, and the labor movement became the like really the biggest champion for 
for uh, undocumented workers and for, you know, in Washington, one of the real heavies at the table for trying to get immigration reform. Sadly, not done yet, but, but uh, I don't think if it weren't for Yablonsky, you there would be no Rich Trumka, or Rich Trumka would have still existed, but he probably would not have had the, the, the career he did. And you have to wonder, like, would there be, you know, would a reform slate have won um, in 1995? Um, it wasn't a done deal by any means. And so um, that's a really important change. And that the Sweeney Trumka slate, like they switched stuff up. There was like, you know, much bigger emphasis on organizing, much bigger emphasis on um, leadership of people of color and of women. Like it was really, um, a, you know, a transformational uh, election within the history of the labor movement. Awesome. I'm going to take that recording of that response using the class. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I, yeah, read, read up more on Yabonsky. It's a great question. Yeah, yeah. He's really interesting. He's really great. Um, I'm going to shift us back in. Um, and this is back to sort of back to focusing on a little bit more about what's changed uh, with the labor movement in the last, like, why there's a decline in the last 50 years. And this question is really about the drop of membership. Um, and then it asks, um, can we conclude the drop in union membership on the uh, end of the graph is that last graph that you showed is basically from moving of most of those unionized jobs from the United States to foreign countries? Um, for example, garment industries are non-existent in the U.S. practically due to them being moved overseas through the lack of unions' ability to pay low wages. Yeah, yeah. So there's some of that. Some of those numbers are. I'd be curious. I, I wonder if anyone's on the actual numbers on it. But yeah, for sure, a little bit of that is globalization, um, and a little bit of that is also increased productivity. Like you need a hell of a lot fewer people to run an auto factory today than you did even 30 years ago. Um, and so those industries that were organized in the 30s and 40s, when it was easier to organize than it is today, um, you know, uh, or maybe that maybe it wasn't easier, maybe the people were tougher than we are, I don't know. But um, uh, the, um, they, uh, it's been hard to replace them, right? So there are fewer manufacturing workers and more people who work for insurance companies or banks, right? And those are two banking and insurance are virtually unorganized parts of the US economy. Um, they're not in other parts of the world, uh, interestingly. And there've been some efforts to organize uh, bank workers, um, modest successes, but, but not, not the knockout punch by any means. Um, so some of that is definitely changing economy uh, sorts of things, um, you know, but it's uh, and, and a move towards a more service-based, less manufacturing economy. Uh, but there's nothing, you know, I wouldn't say that means that like, oh yeah, it's unions for, you know, for factories and for, for the past. Um, because at the same time as you saw from the graph of like the public sector and uh, public sector membership going up, all those public sector unions, that also means unions for social workers and unions for, um, you know, clerks at the, um, uh, at the DMV and for, and for um, you know, the people who, who do, you know, all kinds of things. But so, um, so it's, there's economic changes for sure and the, you know, have an impact. But I wouldn't put it all on on and, and you know definitely globalization. Also, movement within the United States too. Um, so you know you see a, a shift of manufacturing from the industrial uh, north, the industrial Midwest to the American South, um, and you know a, a harder environment for organizing there uh, for sure. Just a different a different history, um, you know, a, a history of racism and slavery, the of, of super you know of underdevelopment of uh, worker underdevelopment of lower wages. Um, and a, and a, um, uh, a sense from a lot of, you know, I've done some organizing in the South. Um, it's not impossible by any means. And, you know, there's, there are success stories in the South, but also it's, it's harder. Like there's no doubt about it. And like lots of times the job that used to be a $25 hour job in Michigan becomes a $12 an hour job in, in Mississippi. And in the, at the $12 an hour rate in Mississippi, it's the best job in town. And so like, you know, the Amazon stuff in Alabama, like, there are a lot of folks who are like, yeah, okay, maybe this is a hard job, but this is a hell of a lot better than, you know, seven bucks an hour or 7.25 an hour working the night shift at the nursing home. Like, so do I want to mess that up? You know, that's, it's a tougher, a tougher situation there. Yeah. Yeah. That regional variation and, you know, even just, even within the, right, even within the same state, what's economically available in your community really shapes your, yeah. your perspective on that stuff for sure. Yeah, I'd also note um, in terms of the globalization piece, it's an important part, and this is another one of those Sweeney, Trumka, Chavez changes in terms of the federation, 
is that the attitude about trade moved from being just sort of like a straight protectionism to a much more complicated point of view on trade and one that emphasized much more um, uh, working conditions in the developing world. So the 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 uh, you'll you'll not find me to say a nice thing about uh, 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 President Trump, uh, but I I I will say that the new uh, the renegotiated NAFTA um, does have some labor protections uh, for Mexican workers, especially that are very exciting, and um, the labor movement played a role in making sure that happened. And we're starting to see in manufacturing in Mexico where there's a, a really awful tradition of corrupt unions, of unions of like protection unions, uh, that's starting to change. So in General Motors, a uh, big factory in Silao, Mexico, they just, uh, workers voted out, um, in part because the protections mandated by the USMCA, uh, workers voted out a corrupt protection union, what we would call like a yellow dog contract. Um, and for, for back in, for those who are teaching that stuff um, and learning that stuff, um, that's the dominant system. So uh, if workers can get independent unions in Mexico, that is great. Uh, and it would, it would mean that like the benefit of trade wouldn't just be flowing you know, up to the corporate headquarters, but would be you know, getting down into, into ordinary people's uh, you know, pocketbooks and wallets uh, in, in Mexico. Okay, great, thanks. Um, we have time for one question and it's gonna be the question that we always like to wrap up, which is actually um, one about any words of wisdom you have for our students. Uh, do you have any advice for our students who are interested in pursuing work as labor organizers? I for sure do. Um, one thing is uh, there is work in the labor movement. Um, there's uh, organizing is a really you know great fun and hard work. Um, if you've done any work in politics, it's kind of similar, right? You know, oftentimes it's election related work. Um, and there's political work in the labor movement too. Labor movement hires people to do political work. Um, there's a website called unionjobs.com. Easy to remember, unionjobs.com. You can check it out. Most unions uh, hire, post their jobs there. Um, so that is one place to look. You could also, you know, I'd also say if you have a job that you want to organize, um, you know, or, organizing is great and and, can, and, and you can do it. Um, so if you go to the AFL-CIO website, you can also um, submit an interest form there and, and we can get you in touch with the right union for your job. Um, but, uh, but also, yeah, totally check it out, volunteer, um, look for jobs. It is a, it's a, it's, it is a really great part of the, part of the workforce to work in. And for people who are, it is a part of the workforce that can play historians, as I stand here, <laughs> stand here with you. Um, your history knowledge will actually be able to put it to good use. Oh, always looking for jobs for historians. Thank you so much. Um, on behalf of the Lytton Center, I want to thank you so much for coming and giving us the most amazingly concise, inspired talk on the labor movement and for sharing your expertise and your organizing experience with us and, and especially with our students. Um, I really thank you for the time. And I thank everyone that came from a variety of different places, whether you're on Facebook or and watching that live stream or here in the Zoom. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us and uh, supporting the Lytton Center. We are excited to be having these kinds of conversations. So thank you again for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It was really a pleasure to do and thanks for the questions that were dynamite. Um, and if people have additional questions, don't hesitate to email me. I'm csweeney at aflcio.org. Um, and, um, and I love the mission of the Lytton Center and appreciate the, the leadership as well. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. -bye. Do you mind putting your email in? That was a bit fast. Didn't catch oh, that. sure. Yeah, that's a great, good point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I should send that to everyone. Thank you for the suggestion. All right.